You are now tuned into the Cut Game Radio Show hosted by Groom City. We the Cut Game Radio Show, we let them know we stay true. To the Cut Game, yeah, that's how we do. It's the Cut Game Radio Show, we let them know we stay true. To the Cut Game, yeah, that's how we do. It's the Cut Game Radio Show, we let them know we stay true. To the Cut Game, yeah, that's how we do. The, the, the Cut Game Radio Show, hosted yeah. by Groom City. That's how we do. What's going on? It's Groom City, and you are now tuned in to the Cut Game Radio Show, number one podcast for your hair needs. And right now, I'm on my mobile situation, and I have an amazing guest on the phone. Now, the Cut Game Radio Show, we are searching, we are seeking for information pertaining to the hair industry, the beauty industry, and we're bringing that information to the listeners. I'm a barber, so I'm also a licensed stylist, but... The barber industry is what I know, it's what I love, it's what I'm passionate about. And I'm passionate about the beauty industry. But being a barber, that's just the service portion of the beauty industry. It's probably represented maybe 5% of the industry. So there's a whole nother portion of the industry out there that exists that a lot of barbers aren't aware of, including myself. So I've been seeking, I've been searching, and today I have an amazing guest on the phone. Now... There's politics in everything. And believe it or not, there's politics in the hair industry. There's politics in the beauty industry. There's politics in barbering on a systemic level. And most barbers I know, they're not aware of it. So today we have someone that's going to make us aware. They're going to educate us on what systems are at play regarding our industry, what systems are at play regarding the business of barbering, the beauty industry, the hair industry. So today we have on the phone a Georgia native who is passionate about the beauty industry. And her name is Tamara Sheely. Are you you a Georgia native? I am Tamara Johnson Sheely. Yes, I am. Born and raised. I'm a Georgia peach. (laughs) That's what's up. So Mm -hmm. I want you you to share a little bit with the listeners before, before you give us some real good game. I want you to share a little bit with the listeners of who you are and what you are passionate about. I'm passionate about this industry, and I fell in love with the beauty industry in the early 90s. I um, was I moved to Atlanta, you know, from Savannah. Um, actually, I'm a country girl. Let me even go back a step further. I mean, I'm so country that when I, my mother's oldest sister used to tell me, these, you know, tell stories about growing up, and she always would say, we grew up in the quarters. And I remember being, like, young and people around me where I grew up, they didn't always wear shoes. But I was always a little different because I grew up actually in the city, but my family was literally all in the country. And I realized how literally I was like a generation or two generations removed from slavery. So when my aunt used to talk about growing up in the quarters, she literally grew up in the slave quarters. Mm. And now she's in her 60s. So for her to have remembered that as a little girl, I just know that how connected I am to my southern roots. So I'm a true Southerner, just to kind of bring you up to speed. So I moved to Atlanta in the early 90s, looking for an opportunity, 21 years old, you know, just spreading my wings and was working at the bank, had gotten robbed twice and realized I had to find something else to do (laughs) because I couldn't keep getting robbed over somebody else's money. So I went to nail school and I went to nail school on a whim that because my aunt had gone and I I was like, well, I used to color as a little girl, and I knew I had a very steady hand, and I liked color, and I, you know, was all into the fashion and beauty and all of that stuff. So when I went to nail school, I literally fell in love with the industry as a whole. Um, Started working in in some great salons around some great barbers, great stylists, and just realized that I had found my place in 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 the world and in my life. I found where I actually belong and where I fit. So my passion, the heart of who I am, literally is rooted in the beauty and barber industry. Wow. So how has that passion grown since you've been 21? Oh, my. So after working in salons and feeling my way and having having kids, and I, I opened up um, my own salon, a nail salon, and owned the salon myself for 10 years. But in those years, I did services professionally for 18 years, but I owned a salon for 10 but in those years, I started watching 
the, my industry do something different. Where I came into the industry and my, the barbers and the stylists around me, I knew they were making six figures. Like, I knew they were making, like, bank. And I was the only nail tech. I would try, I would literally try to be the only nail tech wherever I worked so that I could always feed off of all of them. And it, it worked. My, my little formula worked. And I, I did really well in the industry. And when I opened up my salon and then some years after, I started realizing that something was happening. Like, the money was changing and, you know, the, something was going on. And I, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. So I started, I became a continuing education provider for the industry and just noticed how few people, barbers and stylists, cared about education beyond what they learned in school. I mean, they, they go to a hair show every now and then, but I mean, as far as learning what really matters, which is the health and the safety and the sanitation of this industry, because literally as a professional, that's what I sold. Mm. You know, that, that was what differentiated me from other professionals, because I'm going to tell you, I would not use a towel that had a stain on it. It mm. couldn't, I was so meticulous. If my, if my towel got a a drop of polish or a stain on it. That's a that's a dust rag at that point. Dang. Like I mean, our floors were immaculate. I, we cleaned. I had pedicure chairs, and every time I did a service, not only did I clean the bowl itself, I would run a solution through after every client. Then at night, we would run a stronger solution through to, to make sure we cleaned it. So I was above and beyond with my cleanliness. So the fact that my the client saw how meticulous we were and how clean our facility were and how we cared about their health, safety, and sanitation, that was my selling point. And I can tell you when I left the industry, and I'm a, this is this my truth, mm -hmm. when I left the industry, I was charging $100 for a manicure and a pedicure. Wow. Let me say that again. When I left the industry in 2013, I was charging $100 for a manicure and a pedicure. No. You, can't, you get a manicure and a pedicure for like $25 now. Now, I'm going to backtrack a little bit, and we're going to go right to where we are what was some of the first signs? Okay. i'm so curious what was some of the first signs that you knew that the industry made a shift financially i started seeing other people get second jobs mm. where when i came into the industry people were working full time in the salons and barbershops and they were making it and then i started saw people getting part-time jobs and you know, talk complaining about you know clients not being there, and I and and I felt the pinch too. You know, I was they weren't the only ones. I felt it as a business owner. I'm like, it, something's shifting, and I couldn't put my finger on it. So, nevertheless, I reached out to the board of here in Georgia of cosmetology, and I started going to the meetings, and I started paying attention, and I realized that it was not the industry, it mm. was policy. Mm. When I when I reached out and 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 paid attention and actually got involved with a bigger organization, I went to Capitol Hill. I lobbied on, on Capitol Hill because little do we know, and this is something that some of my, our barbers and our stylists may know who own, if you own a salon or a barbershop and say it's a, it's a commission facility or however you pay your employees, when that employee is tipped, not only is the professional taxed on that tip, the owner is taxed on that tip. So it's double taxation happening in our industry mm. that the restaurant industry was given provisions for that years ago. Like it, in the early 90s, the restaurant industry had been given those, those, that tip credit. So they're not double taxed in the industry, in their industry. But we are, and we've been, and it's been happening for a long time. And the federal government won't give us that kind of tip credit because this is an industry, first of all, that we don't pay taxes like we should nor do we pay back our student loans. We have a very high default rate. Mm. So the federal government is looking at us like, well, why should we do anything to help this industry when this industry is not doing what it's supposed to do? So I lobbied on Capitol Hill after I got involved and realized it was policy and it was politics. So I lobbied on Capitol Hill with a bigger organization, and I did it for two years, and then I realized that there was nothing specifically being targeted to help the professionals because my efforts were helping – business owners beyond the professional and they weren't targeted enough to get to the root of who this is really affecting. So it's really affecting those of us that are independent people that have worked independently or, or who work independently. Those are the people that are feeling this pitch the most and it's rooted in politics. Mm. That's heavy. Now, man, that's heavy. <laughs> so what, 
<laughs> it's deep, but I, and I try not to. I try to keep it on the surface where we can really grasp it, yeah. because it, it, as we start to grasp what is happening to us as an industry, then you're going to see the root of what's happening to people, not just black people, but minorities, and you know what's happening with with you know we got all kind of systemic issues that you know, it gets so deep that if we can recognize the problem as it affects us directly. We can recognize the problems as it affects us in our communities, in our states, and nationally, and globally. Once you connect it, it's going to make sense in such a bigger way to the extent that now that's why we started two organizations. I got beyond helping, you know, like I say, the, the business of, you know, those that are doing business in this industry. And I wanted to get to the helping the people in this industry, bringing it home. Because I'm one, I'm, I'm one of these, I was at that time, one of those people in the trenches doing the work because I still did services at that time. Mm. So we started the Concerned Beauty Professionals and we started Politics Beauty. The Concerned Beauty Professionals is the education piece of what we do. It substantiates this industry and said this makes you professional because every industry has a component that where you have education beyond what you learn in school. That equates to professionalism. Hmm. You can't say you're a professional and you're not getting any further education. It ain't about learning a new cut. Mm, that's skill. That's talent. You know, that's fun. Let's get to health and safety and sanitation and business and technology and marketing. Let's make sure we ha you know, have some further education in client relations. Like there's other areas that equate to professionalism beyond skill because there's some people born with natural talent and natural skill, and that doesn't make them a professional. What makes us a professional is what we have up in our head, not what we can do with our hands. Can you repeat that for the guests <laughs> one more time? For, can you repeat that for the <laughs> listeners one more time? That professionalism is about what we have in our head, not about what we can do with our hands. Because there's so many people that today, if you look at these YouTubers, some of these young people are born with talent, are born just natural creativity. We can't, I mean, hey, that, no comparison. That's nothing. Some of these people, you know, can cut you under the table. But how knowledgeable are you? And that is the defining line between a professional and a non-professional. Mm. So when we started the Concerned Beauty Professionals, that's our education component. you got to have some education beyond what you do, beyond what you learned in school, because what you learned in school was foundational. That'll get you started. That ain't the rest of it. You know, that ain't the be-all. you got to have more, and you got to be committed to continual education. So that's the Concerned Beauty Professionals. But the politics beauty side is the legislative piece. That is where we encourage our industry to be involved politically. And being involved politically is about being aware. And in our barbershops and in our hair salons, we have conversations about everything, <laughs> literally. Yeah. I mean, we need to start having conversations. And I know, you know religion and politics are very touchy and sticky situations, but we have them. You know, we, we, we're so versed with our clients that we're, we know who to have a conversation with and who not to have a conversation with. So we know. Yeah. So we need to be more uh, in tune with what's happening politically because this stuff is affecting you in your pocket. This is your money every day. And when you have, you know, legislators around this country that are writing policy to devalue us as an industry because there's a corporate agenda for these corporations to put workers into the workforce because that's the – they don't want to – they call it a barrier to entry. Licensure – this current administration that we have politically, licensure, they see it as a barrier to entry. That means that because people have to be licensed, we can't hire and put people into the workforce. So they say they call it a barrier to entry. So what they want to do is get rid of the licensing or devalue the licensing. Across the nation, they've been saying that barbers literally on the chopping block, our industry as a whole, but barbers, they just want to wipe you out. One year, and I want to say this was maybe about three, maybe about three years ago, we looked at the numbers, but I'm just going to talk about Georgia. Our efforts are nationwide, but I'm just going to kind of tell you this little quick story about Georgia. Yeah. In that one year, they had 5,000 barbers licensed on record. And I can tell you, because I live in the state of Georgia, we got 5,000 barbers in the city of Atlanta alone. Mm. That number is skewed tremendously. That's because so many of our barbershops are allowing people to come in and cut and not be licensed. 
or you know allow people to work in an industry that they have don't have formal training yeah but they they might be able to cut but are they going to bring harm to you in the process mm. so we we are sometimes we're our own worst enemy not only do the legislators want to kill us off but we killing our own selves off by allowing the things that happen in this industry we, we killing our own we we helping them so there's a whole political agenda to devalue us as professionals because in the state of Texas, for example, and I was pissed, you know, it was, it was during the time when we first started our efforts and I couldn't galvanize the industry to the extent that I wanted to. Mm. And in the state of Texas, some business owners got together and said, and I talked to the person who spearheaded it. And I was, I literally almost took her head off, but I, I, I held it together because I was that angry. Yeah. But they went and wrote legislation in the state of Texas that gives the cosmetologists, and I love my industry, but don't make me fight my own. But it gave the cosmetologists the ability to use a safety razor to shave the back of the neck and the face instead of using a straight razor. You know what that does? That blurs the line between our cosmetologists and our barbers and give cosmetologists the ability to do something that is not technically in their lane to do. Because guess what? These corporate salons and these barbershops that are popping up that are corporate, they want to be able to hire people and they want to be able to do everything mm. at the expense of, of our industry. Man. Man. I get on my soapbox, so you kind of yeah, have to no, reel me no. in. <laughs> I mean, this is this is the platform to, to get on that soapbox and really educate us and inform us on what's going on and how severe and how serious things can get and how it can wipe out barbering to people who's not aware that may seem far fetched, but in California, I believe they made an effort to deregulate barbering and that can affect a 5,000 year old art form. Mm -hmm. And it's an agenda nationwide. It's an agenda nationwide to devalue professionals in this industry because they don't see us as professionals. I've had legislators to ask me, well, what are you, why, do you, why does your industry need to be licensed? All you do is cut hair. All you do is do nails or do facials. Like, why do you need a license to do that? Once you go to school, you learn how to do it. So why do you need to be licensed afterwards? Mm. And these are legislators. And the, see, this is where let me bring it home to our power as an industry. There are millions of us nationwide, millions of us nationwide. The one thing a legislator fears is not being reelected. We can't buy them because there's a whole other level of, of money out there that, you know, that they're influenced by. But we can sure enough vote them in and vote them out. So this is where the, there's power in our industry. Because if we get, if we understood how this political machine works and, un, and knew who our legislators were and we galvanized around the issues, and that's what we do as an organization. Politics, beauty, we track legislation state to state to state. So we are able to go in and tell you specifically what this legislation is, who introduced it, and how we need to attack this. And I don't want us to always be on the defense. Sometimes we, we got to get on the offense. Yeah. So not only should we be fighting legislation that's designed to our detriment, we should be initiating le legislation that raises the standards of our industry and propels us forward as professionals. So we got to do a lot of work and a lot of homework. It's like teaching our industry a new language. I remember the first time I walked into one of our barbershops and beauty salons and I started talking about legislation. I swear, I think they thought I had two heads and I was crazy. <laughs> They're like, Bill, I mean, what you talking about? Like, well, Bill, what's the bill? Like, we got to learn what is a bill? Who are these people that are initiating these bills? Do they represent me in my district? Where is my district? You know, who is my state senator? Who is my representative in the House? Who's my county commissioner? You know, who's my council person? Like, there's levels and layers to government where we could affect so much change, but we got to understand the system. And not only can we help ourselves as an industry, I mean, we got all kind of problems in our community. Barbers are the pillars, particularly in the black community. Barbershops and churches was all we had. We don't have the churches no more. They so scared to do anything that affects their 501 c that they not really able to help the people the way we should. So people come to the barbershop and they have problems and issues. We need to know how to help solve these problems. And in politics, it's in the air we breathe, the water we drink. Look at Flint. 
Mm. We should be we should have galvanized all of our barbershops and beauty salons up there in Flint, and we could have done so many different things if we had just galvanized in that state and in that city. Because I know there's barbershops, there's beauty salons. So you saying hair professionals got power we haven't even tapped into? Ain't ain't we ain't even scratched the surface? I don't even think all of us even see it. <laughs> Now, if I could just get you to see the power, we can get there together. <laughs> now, you definitely educated us on what's out there, and it's it's deep. It's a lot. It's a lot to chew on. Do you have any quick tips that can maybe barbers, maybe some shop owners can hear this message and implement certain things in their shop, or maybe just individuals can hear a couple quick tips on what they can do to get involved into politics that helps our industry? So the first thing I would say is to know what's going on around you as far as, like, we hear the issues. I mean, they bring, they bring them to us in the, in the barbershops and the beauty salons. They bring the issues to us. We know what's going on. You know, then we need to find out who our legislators are around us. I mean, that's, if, who is your, your city council person? Who sits on the Board of Education? You know, who's the fire? Who, who's your police? Who's your sheriff? You know, know these people in these places. Like, who's your state senator? Who's your house rep? You know, we got to know who these people are that represent the district where, we, where we're serving because we're, we're servants. You know, beauty and barber professionals, let's, let's first put that in your mind. You are a servant. So you need to know these people in these places because you have to serve your community and you can't just, you know, it's not about just making them look good. You got to, sometimes we got to help in bigger ways than just making people look good. So know these people around you. And then the second ask is that I would tell you to do is, is get involved with our organization. Uh, our website is www.politicsbeauty.org. Get involved with what we're doing. Get involved because there's power in the movement and there's power in organizing and being a part of something that's bigger than yourself. It's greater good for all of us. So be a part of what we're doing. We do industry day. We're getting ready to do our fifth annual industry day in February. It's the first and first Monday and Tuesday in February. So that's February 5th and 6th. We have a full day of advocacy training. This is where you get the nuts and bolts on what it means to be an advocate, what it means to, to fight for something. How do you fight for it? We have a facilitator. His name is Mr. Bill Fletcher. He's going to be um, with us that day. We're going to go over to the to the Capitol. We host this event in Atlanta so that people can take this thing and all this great information back to their prospective states, and then we work together. Because state to state to state, if we were all on the same page, we would create uniformity in our industry where our laws will, will reciprocate. That means that you can go from state to state and you got the same laws that we abide by in Mississippi and, and in California yeah. and in Texas. Like we, I mean, we, we need to have laws that, that look like the industry as a whole, not look like some randomness because that's what we have now. So be involved in what we're doing. And literally that's the answer. It's not rocket science. It's about understanding what's happening around you and being a part of something that connects you to the greater good, to the bigger picture. And that's what we do. So just getting involved. Just getting involved, being with like-minded professionals. Now, can you share with our listeners different scenarios that can happen if we don't get involved, if we don't get knowledgeable about politics pertaining to the hair industry? Yeah, let me give you one that's happening today. Mm. Uh, it happened Friday. Okay, so the city of Atlanta, just to let me go back a step. First of all, I'm running for the state senate. That wasn't something that I said earlier, but I am a candidate for the Georgia State Senate because we got to get people with the heart for this industry on the inside of the legislative process. And I can tell you that what happens in one state, states don't just make up laws. They duplicate laws state to state to state. So if we get something right in one place, it's so easy to, to replicate that in another state. And then legislators convene around different issues nationally. So that there's an issue and there's a you know a movement behind it, and they want legislators to hear them. Legislators may all you know go out to Colorado, you know, around whatever issue, and 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 meet other legislators. So legislators, state to state, my point is they all know each other. Legislation, state to state, is is duplicated. They don't reinvent the wheel; they just duplicate it. 
Okay, so there's once we get somebody on the inside of the legislative process, it opens the doors for this industry. I will be the first beauty and barber professional to ever be elected to a state legislature if I'm elected, when I'm elected. I'm not going to say if, when I'm elected. This is not my first run. I ran in 2014. I garnered 37% as a no-name candidate. 2016, I ran again. I got 43%. I'm only 7% away from winning. If I win, it opens the door nationwide for our industry to have laws written that look like what our industry needs to look like. Because I'm telling you, I'm going in writing them. Mm. <laughs> I'm going in writing all kind of stuff for us. So I want us to be real clear about what that agenda needs to look like. So that's going to be a part of our industry day. We'll, we'll be talking about the agenda for this industry because we need to be real clear about the specifics of what we want to see happen in the, for the future of, of our industry. Um. I went off on a tangent. I told you you have to bring yeah. me back in. So tell yeah. what was the other half of that question? I'm sorry. Now, what do you see happening to the industry and specifically the barber industry if us barbers and hair professionals don't get involved with politics? We're going to go broke because you're going to have these corporate salons with a corporate agenda with corporate marketing dollars that are going to create this, this, the consumers are going to start to see, you know, they don't want to go to no little barbershop. They want, I mean, they're, and they're already doing that. They're creating this, you know, this place where people are not coming to, especially our hairstylists. They're not getting their hair colored. You know, you can, you can color your hair at home or so many ways that they're targeting this industry to pull the money out from the people that do it. Mm. So we're not going the money is that we get like these I've seen people have ten dollars and seven dollars posted on the glass for the salons and barbershops for haircuts seven dollars ten dollars it's we're devout we we're we're paying people gonna pay you less and I don't know how many people can live off seven dollar haircuts if they did them all day like I don't know if you could really live off that mm. so the money it's affecting the money in your pocket. Ultimately, there's a corporate agenda because this is a multi-billion dollar industry that people want this money. So I need our listeners, I need you guys to get involved, whether it's just being aware of what's going on in your city politically. So I want you guys to get involved because we need that connection. Everyone's connected on sharing information, and but we're not connected politically. We don't have a political voice. So let's make a small effort moving towards creating unity so we can have a political voice within the hair industry. So Tamara, I want to yes, ask, sir. we, we <laughs> asked everyone on this show if there was a code of conduct for barbers and stylists, what code would Tamara Sheely add to it? A code of conduct for our industry. I think you said it. I think you said it perfectly is to be more aware politically and be so that so that you can be a catalyst to change in the community that you serve i believe that's what we need that would be it that's what's up so right now i'm gonna give you the stage we always have our guests share some good cut game but i want you to share you've been giving us game all episode but i just want you to really give us some good political game that we can take home and apply to our daily lives and hopefully make those connections politically within our industry. Just be mindful, um, beauty and barber professionals, that the food you eat is political. The water you drink is political. The air you breathe is political. So there's no way, nothing you do in your life, the car you drive, Everything is rooted in policy and politics. So there's no way around it. There's no way of escaping it. And if you ignore it, it's going to continue to affect us to our own detriment. And until we get organized and, and mobilized, we're going to continue to fail as an industry. My son just started barbering school two weeks ago. I am so proud. I am so so, 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 so proud because I knew my son hated school <laughs> and I literally drug my child through high school, drug him. Like you go walk across the stage if I got to push you across myself. So my son just started barbering school and I know this is going to be the rest of his life. He loves it. 
he loves it. He don't know what he's doing. He can't cut. <laughs> but he loves the atmosphere. He, 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 he's so eager to learn. He, he's so into it that I know he has found his place the same way I found mine. This is my second generation. I hope my grandkids and my great-grandkids continue in this industry. So I have a personal obligation, a moral obligation, and a professional obligation to be a part of making sure this industry is great for the next generation. So I hope that you will join us. Again, our website is www.politicsbeauty.org. Join us. Be a part of what we're doing. And let's make sure that this is round for your kids, your grandkids, and your great-grandkids. Because it worked for me, and I want to be sure it works for all of us to come. Well, thank you for blessing us with your presence on the Cut Game Radio Show. Make sure you guys follow Tamara Sheely's websites. And also check her out on Instagram at Tamara Sheely. That's T-A-M-A-R-A-S-H-E-A-L-E-Y. And do you have a Facebook? Yep. I do. Um, Tamara Sheely on Facebook. Um, I'm also, you can look up Politics Beauty on Facebook and the Concerned Beauty Professionals on Facebook as well. And Twitter, Tamara Sheely. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure y'all like, share, follow the Cut Game Radio Show. Make sure y'all check us out. We're available now on any podcast platforms and whatever podcast platform that you guys are listening to us. Make sure you leave a review. That helps with our ranking. That just helps with our growth. So y'all stay groomed, stay elevated, stay on your jet fuel, and make sure you stay on your politics. Cut Game Radio Show. We out. That concludes our show. Please join us next week as we chop up game and share secrets to success on the Cut Game Radio Show.